This talk, as most of you know, is organized by the Canvas group. Um, and we're very pleased to have this lively, robust group. Um, this is part of their uh, speakers series, which includes artists and um, scholars, curators, art dealers. <laughs> So all of you, I would say, um, because you, you either work here or you have come in the main entrance, um, have by now had the experience of walking into the building and being drawn up short or stopped in your place by this glorious painting that we have on view in the entry concourse. Um, and it's, uh, it's a fantastic addition to our collection and a real signature piece now for the museum. Um, so I'm especially pleased that tonight we have the artist uh, who created that piece, Ryan McGinnis, here to speak to us. And um, much has been made of Ryan's uh, student days at Carnegie Mellon University where he studied painting and design simultaneously um, and how Pit in Pittsburgh and how that's the home of Andy Warhol. Um, and that's certainly an interesting connection. And also, I'm sure you know about his early interest in skate and surf culture growing up in Virginia Beach. Um, you may also know about his design interests, which he pursued after school, um, including a stint at Pentagram in New York, which is the design firm who, uh, who is responsible for our very colorful logo. Um, but what I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of background on our specific connection with Ryan and how this project came about. And then um, I will turn over the uh, podium to Ryan. We first acquired a painting by Ryan in 2005. And it's a very beautiful painting, um, a, a floridly decorative painting on red metallic car paint. And it has the unlikely title of He Who Pays the Piper Calls the Tune. Um, <laughs> And this was a painting that was acquired um, or a gift from the Fabergé Society. And they uh, are uh, one of our upper level donor groups or member uh, levels who are specifically interested in acquiring work by Virginia artists. Um, and Ryan was born and raised in Virginia Beach. And so that began the interest in his work. Um, and once we began building this new building, we, we started looking about for a way to mark the building with a major work of contemporary art. And immediately, Ryan came to mind. And the Virginia Connection was a part of that. Um, but really, the primary reason had to do with selecting an artist who had the capacity to make something um, that would be welcoming, that would be vibrant and dynamic, and that would really uh, make a statement. Now, um, we began a process, a communication with Ryan that lasted over a number of years. Uh, and finally, we arrived at the, the final concept, which was to mark the entryway to the museum and that Ryan would create 200 new images all based on our collection through study of the uh, collection in person, through books, um, through looking at our website. And he will tell you more about that process in detail. Um, but I should also say that during the process, Ryan shared the notebook, the preliminary notebook of sketches with the staff. And curators had a chance to respond and make suggestions to him. So that in the end, we have this very balanced representation from all parts of our collection. Um, on the other hand, we did not ask Ryan to select the greatest hits of the museum um, or the highlights. Instead, we really kept it completely open so that he would choose the works that he responded to. And again, he'll explain um, how and why. Um, so the, the final result, obviously, is a, a magnificent set of 16 paintings that measure 8 feet tall by 32 feet wide and that make a really monumental entryway and are a cornucopia of images um, and uh, a, a real statement about the inclusive nature of the collection at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. So I'm delighted to welcome Ryan here. 
And um, please, please welcome him to the podium. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? It's funny, I was just standing there, right? Just, can we kill the lights? Oh, thank you for having me. I'm really excited about um, these paintings, and I'm really proud of them. And I'm excited to walk you through the process and share with you um, how I developed them over a period of, I think it's been three or four years. Is that right, John? Yeah. I was born in Virginia Beach. <laughs> And this is the proof. My parents actually moved away after um, I was born for a few years and came back to Virginia Beach. So I actually grew up there, kindergarten through 12th grade. That's me in the front. <laughs> and uh, that's my sister. And that's my father surfing in the back. I just wanted to use this. Um, growing up in Virginia Beach, I um, sailed a lot. And actually, this is a symbol of the sailboat that my family had. I also grew up playing soccer. And I was on the traveling team for Virginia Beach. So I would travel on the weekends throughout the state and up and down the East Coast uh, representing my city. I also made art growing up. It's a conceptual drawing. <laughs> this is a very telling spread from my junior high yearbook. I was in the computer club and the art club. I grew up in a house where my mom made a lot of things all the time. There were a lot of craft making stations. Um, she would cut things like this out of, um, of wood with a bandsaw, and we had a jigsaw and table saw and big workshop in the, um, in the garage. And uh, we were always making things. And I made a lot of my own toys growing up. So these are things that my mother made, very simple, iconic. I went to Frank W. Cox High School um, off of Great Neck Road in Virginia Beach. This is uh, a, a display of my work that I did there. I also attended, um, while in grade school and through high school, the Old Donation Center for Gifted and Talented. And um, it, it's really there that I studied art. I didn't take many art classes in, in the normal kind of school program. But I would go here one, one day a week in grade school and then um, after school when I was in high school. And it was a great um, program. I'm, I'm sure it still exists. And um, it, it was a great um, environment in which I was able to um, pursue and study art. And it was taken very seriously. And our work was critiqued by our peers and by our teachers. And um, it, it um, really instilled in me a very a serious attitude toward art and art making. Um, so I would also, I would go there and kind of make art in a very formal way, but I would also make things, of course, outside of school um, and make cassette covers for like high school bands that I was in. <laughs> and while pursuing um, art and art studies, I also um, was very uh, involved in school politics and SCA, and so I would use kind of my um, creative skills to make campaign flyers. This one was effective. <laughs> I was um, class president, school vice president, and honor society president, and did all of those things. And was, like I said, kind of very academically um, driven. And while in high school, I found that that pursuit and those um, abilities were um, kind of at odds with uh, a pursuit and study of, of art um, because there weren't a lot of kids that kind of crossed over um, both of those worlds. Uh, when I was in high school, I also had a 
fortunate opportunity to work uh, at an after school job at the local Navy base. This was um, at Oceana. Uh, I think there are five Navy bases in Virginia Beach. And I was the artist slash illustrator. And so I would go there after school and on the weekends and make signs for the morale, welfare, and recreation department. So that really entailed um, making signs for the pool, making signs for the mess hall, and menus, and posters, and newsletters. And I got to work on a photocopier and a, an old-fashioned Croy lettering machine and a hot wax machine and do a lot of um, you know, real copy and paste and a lot of um, paste up. And um, this was you know, before um, desktop publishing. And um, it was very exciting for me. I would get to work on my own school projects. And I had the best you know, front page cover for my reports and best posters. And uh, I also developed this uh, logo while I was in high school um, for one of the air shows. Um, actually, it's this logo that got me the job there. So I was really fortunate to have that after school job and have that experience. And um, it, it, it helped me understand that um, I, I could kind of pursue this thing called art in a, a very kind of um, constructive way where there was a lot of reasoning behind what you were making. Um, and then I had discovered that this, was, this thing that I was doing was called uh, design. So I knew that I really wanted to study uh, design because in Virginia Beach, there aren't a, there were, at the time, there, there was, this was like before the Virginia Beach Center for the Arts, there wasn't um, a lot of um, uh, ways to kind of ex have art, you know, real world art experiences besides um, you know, field trips to Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, but that was still a ways away. Um, and also the Boardwalk Art Show, which you know, as, a, as a child I, I recognized as um, still kind of corny and goofy, and it wasn't really quite the same kind of art world that um, I knew through magazines like Interview Magazine and um, you know, other art magazines that I would go to the library to, um, to read. So the point is that I didn't really know that there, uh, that the you know, proper pursuit and the proper career in art um, was a possibility. Um, but I knew that you know, this thing that I was doing kind of on my own and also at my after school job called design um, seemed like a, a direction I wanted to go in. Also growing up in Virginia Beach, of course, I, I was immersed in the surf and skate culture. And so I began to understand the um, perceived power of um, logos and um, understand that these different kinds of signifiers for what was cool um, really differentiated between these different uh, companies what were primarily the same objects. For instance, all t-shirts are the same, skateboards are all just molded plywood and, and surfboards are primarily all the same material and it's, what, it's these different kind of um, logos that differentiated them and again kind of gave them this uh, perceived uh, value. Um, and, and, and I could see these companies start to cultivate their own um, cult of what was cool. And so that, that understanding um, you know, stuck with me. And I, I furthermore wanted to assume that power for myself. And again, uh, assume it in a, um, yeah, in a design program. And so I went to, I got a scholarship and I went to uh, Carnegie Mellon University and entered their uh, design program, which is very, it's a very rigorous program, and um, you s we start out doing very basic line studies and shape studies and um, a lot of kind of exercises that would be described as, you know, wax on, wax off. You don't really understand why you're doing it until you have to apply what you've learned. And so a lot of, like, positive, negative shape um, explorations. These are all um, painted by hand. Again, this was really just ab about the same time that desktop publishing was, was coming into its own and becoming more and more accessible. And through the design program, we learned how to kind of distill down um, and communicate in a very efficient way to create you know, logos and icons. And of course, when I was in school, I was also pursuing um, painting, a painting degree in parallel. So I, I still had these kind of both worlds um, in my mind that were kind of split and there was a divide. And when I graduated, I moved to New York and, and um, all of those experiences have really influenced um, 
what I do now and how I make my work. And how I, how I make my work is really, it all comes down to making uh, drawings. At the root of all the sculptures and installations and paintings uh, really is uh, developing drawing. And I don't make um, uh, drawings in a very magical way like most artists. They can um, you know, make something beautiful on the first go. I have to go through a drawing process and um, go through a sketch process. And so these are some examples of, of um, different drawings that I've developed. Everything really starts with uh, pen and ink for me. I'm, I'm sketching and developing and searching for a, uh, an underlying logical geometry to my form, something that really makes sense um, so that I, I, I'm, I know that when the drawing is done, I have found um, the solution. Um, a lot of um, art in general is, is the pursuit of the truth, and I'm pursuing a, um, a truth in form with a lot of my drawings. So here you can see the kind of the, the, the development through these sketches of a drawing that eventually ends up like that. Sometimes they're um, darker concepts that are being communicated, and in some cases those um, get um, drawn, redrawn, and developed, and even abstracted, so that in the end they may not even be um, legible or, or reference what was originally intended. So when I was in New York, I was, I was still painting, and I was still pursuing this thing called design, and I was doing a lot of freelance work and applying my skills um, to make money by designing logos and album covers and uh, posters. And, um, and, and I did work at uh, Pentagram for a while. Um, but I was also pursuing, again, um, this, uh, this other thing called art and making paintings and being in group shows. And it wasn't really until about 1999 or the year 2000 where I decided that I was going to stop making um, art or stop making what I thought was considered art. Because I think a, a, uh, a trap that a lot of young artists fall into is that they make things that they, that they already know would be accepted as art, or make things that look like art. If you want to be an artist, then of course you've got to make art, so you've got to make the things that look like art. And consequently, I was making a lot of work that um, uh, looked like a lot of artists that I liked, like uh, David Sally paintings or um, Donald Batchelor or um, artists whose work was, uh, you know, um, I, I, I just simply liked and I was able to kind of um, mimic that and, and own, own it to, uh, you know, to, to a degree. But, you know, it really wasn't until like 99 and 2000 I decided to stop that and I was just going to do whatever I wanted to do, which was really make these kind of iconic drawings. That's really what I love doing. That's, um, that's what makes sense to me and that's where I find um, the truth and the truth for myself. This is really um, the you know, first real honest work that I made. It's a 360 panel uh, painting. It's about, uh, I guess, maybe like 40 feet long. And this is also some early work from about uh, 2001 or so. These are porcelain baked enamel pieces. Um, very simple, iconic. My interest in developing signs and symbols and drawing in that way has to do with um, understanding the world around me and how I can best represent it to the degree that the symbols no longer refer to anything and they really kind of fold in on themselves. Not unlike that, you know, what, what the image on the right represents, just the mind folding in on itself. This is actually a, a mirror maze that I created where I put my drawings on the mirror and they could reflect infinitely. And again, this whole, this is called Worlds Within Worlds. Um, and again, it's the idea of these drawings forever folding in on themselves. Um, also, my drawings, after I go through a sketch process, then I um, make a, uh, a very clean, um, iconic, um, graphic uh, drawing, like you saw, the black and white, that is essentially a vector file 
which really just means it's, a, it's an equation. It's a digital file. So that means that no one original of the uh, drawing exists. There are many uh, originals that exist in parallel. It's the nature of it being digital. So they can be replicated forever. And so that concept is reflected in this um, mirror maze. This is another installation I actually did in the same place at Deitch Projects in New York. And this, this installation was actually before the mirror maze. My own art history isn't linear, so <laughs> I'll jump around a little. This is vinyl and paint on the wall. For most of my um, exhibitions, I will create an installation as a way to take over and own the space and create um, a very specific location and context for the paintings. So uh, this work exists on the wall, and then there are also, there are also paintings that exist um, within this space. In a lot of my work, I play with scale shifts um, as a way to reflect the uh, fractal base um, model of the universe. So you can go in and see same forms and worlds within worlds, and you can also zoom out and see similar worlds. This is a, uh, an installation in a traveling um, museum show, Beautiful Losers. Again, I'm creating the environment in, in which to locate my own paintings. This is a, uh, a similar strategy employed here for a show in, in Paris. This is uh, 2005. In addition to making installations and paintings and Sculptures, I, I like to make objects that exist on the other end of the price point spectrum, such as soccer balls and skateboards, T-shirts. Any kind of object that is a natural extension of who I am or, or where I grew up. This was in La Jolla, Quint Contemporary Art. I think this is uh, 2004. That is a metallic vinyl on the wall behind the canvas. And this was also at Deitch Projects. This is called Installation View, where I took the forms of the of signage like the and turned them into like these two-sided um, paintings, these tondos that come out and invade the space. These are fiberglass forms. This was a project that was curated by the Public Art Fund in New York. It's a bit of a, an urban landscape intervention where I made these signs and that um, the idea was that they would operate as normal signs and kind of blend into the environment where I matched the paint to the lamp posts. Um, they're steel, they're two-sided, uh, and, you, and um, normally you would walk past them and then maybe do a double take and try to um, unpack the the different meanings. That's triple Elvis on the left. And on the right, while well, that top drawing is of a um, uh, welcome pineapple grenade. <laughs> Not so much in the north, but of course in the south, the uh, pineapple banner is a symbol of welcoming, of course, as you know. This is um, Deitch Project's last year in exhibition um, with, a, with a mural in the background.
paintings and sculptures. These are mirror polished, or this is a mirror polished stainless steel sculpture. I build the sculptures in a very similar way that I build the paintings, um, kind of collaging together the different drawings, of course, with the sculpture, doing so in, in space. These are about four feet high. This is a uh, car paint on uh, aluminum. And this is acrylic on acrylic. These are some more recent sculptures. As with the paintings, the sculptures have gotten more fragmented than abstracted. This is actually six feet across. These are some black light paintings. I've been using fluorescent paint in the past few years as a way to um, create work that really has to be experienced in person. Um, there's no way that you can simulate the effects of fluorescent paint or even the effect that fluorescent paint has under black light. Um, there, there's no way you can simulate it with, uh, you know, on a screen or, or on a printed page um, just because the, the effect is a result of the, of the material that has to be experienced in person. This is, these are fluorescent uh, paintings on canvas hung on a wall in front of uh, fluorescent vinyl all under black light. And these are actually some paintings from this earlier this year. There's, um, there's Romulus and Remus in here. And a lot of people don't know there was actually a, um, a uh, I think it was a woodpecker or a robin that was fe also feeding them. Um, so there are a lot of um, art history references in the work, such as this image here. This is a, um, from a Raoul Hausman Dada sculpture, one of my favorites. I'll show you that um, a little bit later, how the development of that. This is actually a figure from uh, Garden of Earthly Delights from Bosch with um, some sneakers that I hung off the antlers. <laughs> this is, um, this is, what is this? This is, oh, I'm doing a series of works on my, I'm making wigs of my own hair and I'm making the third one, growing the third one right now. So this is actually um, autobiographical. And this is, this is also autobiographical. This is me, silk screening. Um, and there, there, you know, of course, there are some other images in there. Some skateboarders here with skulls, you know, rainbow between their skulls. Um, this is a diptych. It's about um, eight feet wide by four feet. It says capitalism versus socialism. <laughs> I was dating a Spanish woman at the time. This is about eight feet wide. Uh, no, I'm sorry, this is 12 feet wide, eight feet high. This is also a recent painting, four feet square. These are all acrylic on canvas. And again, the process is um, layered and layered silk screened images. This is uh, six feet square with a fluorescent yellow background. In here, you can see some more um, art history references. These images or these drawings are from uh, Magritte paintings. Um, this is also Magritte. This is a uh, Madonna and Child. Um, so th I mean, there's a, there's a lot here. In, in addition to uh, you know images from popular culture and from simply things that I like, like this is from a Misfits band, the band Misfits. Um, this is a drill reproduced at one-to-one -one scale from my studio. So there are a lot of studio tools that pop in that are also kind of autobiographical. Um, this image is from a Bosch painting as well. So the, the source of the images run the gamut from simply things I like or things from my past or history to um, things in popular culture or pop songs or dreams 
or hallucinations or even art history itself. So before I, I was uh, working on the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts pieces, I had developed um, a small body of drawings based on some popular art history works. You recognize that as Venus of Villendorf. There's that Raoul Hausmann sculpture. So for the um, Virginia Museum of Fine Arts piece, it's called Art History is Not Linear. Um, although it's often taught as such, culture is a multidimensional network that feeds and builds upon itself in a mashup that transcends time. I'm reading the words on the screen. My idea for this work was to use the museum's permanent collection as source material for new works that would become part of the same permanent collection, thus forward, forcing the whole collection to fold in on itself. 200 drawings were developed based solely on works in the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts permanent collection. Uh, these images were collaged together through the silk screen painting process to create a set of 16 paintings, and that's what's in the, in the foyer out there. So now I want to show you the kind of behind the scenes process for developing each of those singular drawings. Again, I'm using the same kind of um, drawing process that I use and have used for a few years. In some cases, there's a more direct kind of representational um, result. In this case, um, the resulting drawing comes from only a part of the original artwork, which you can see is up here. So I took that figure, which was artwork in artwork, and then developed sketches. Originally, I was going to come up with something that was based only on line, but I really prefer shapes. And in the end, it becomes somewhat abstract. I'm not sure how legible some of these are in the end because of I'm a part of the process, of course, so I'm not sure if this really reads as you know, a, a distressed man with his hands over his head or not. I'll go through the sketch process again, trying to find the underlying geometry, some kind of um, logic um, to the forms. I worked from uh, many publications that the museum has published over the years and also did a couple of site visits. I photographed works just taking snapshots by myself. Also, um, John took me to the, um, the storage facilities and we were able to pull out paintings from the racks and photograph things there. This is taking, taken from this image on the right here. Once I've figured out a drawing, then the sketch, the final sketch, gets scanned and it's used as a template to create a new drawing in uh, Illustrator. That's the program I use uh, primarily for making the final vector drawings.
the drawing process and developing all of these drawings for this project is what really took most of the time. It took about um, over two years to develop all 200 drawings. In this case, you can see that I was primarily interested in, of course, the head and then this hand. Once I finished all 200 drawings, and actually I, I did about 240, so there are some outtakes and settled on final, a, a nice solid set of 200. I. Um, made screens, silk screens, of the different drawings at different sizes and different scales. And of course, use the screens to make the paintings. And the, these snapshots give you an idea of how that's done. I paint horizontally. All the paintings are done uh, flat um, because they really have to be done that way for, for the silk screening. I'm screening acrylic paint. In the final stages of the painting, I'll actually tilt it up uh, so I can get a, uh, see, it, see it better. And throughout the painting process, I'll actually put them on the wall, um, take notes, and then put them back down. So the paintings really start out like this. I you know, decide on the different, uh, different color backgrounds. And the picture planes really grow very simply with uh, just a few drawings, and then add more, and add more, and add more. And this is the final drawing, or the final painting, I should say. Again, each panel is four feet square and it's all acrylic paint on wood panel. I'll show you all the final paintings now. Some of my more recent paintings outside of this body of work have um, been pushed toward, more toward um, kind of illegible mashups. Um, and I wanted to make sure with these I didn't go too far so that you could still read some of the individual images. So there was a delicate balance I had to uh, maintain. So this is an example of how one could unpack or kind of reverse engineer the paintings, <laughs> starting with the final painting and kind of working backwards to break apart and see the individual drawings and then, of course, see the original source for those drawings. Thank you. Let's see. Yeah. We're actually going to have, um, I'll have a short dialogue with Ryan now, and then we'll have a chance for questions from the audience. Actually see if we can stretch this. Yeah, I'll bring this computer over and, oh, that's fine. That's just power. That's and um, I'll be able to reference any earlier slides so we can go back. I, I shot through some of those really quickly. Go behind so. Well, at the very end, Brian, you started to mention about um, how this particular space, how you wanted to not pack the paintings too densely because you wanted them to be legible. 
And of course, you've talked about how the whole, um, the whole commission came about based on studying our collection. But I'm curious if you can just talk a little bit more about um, what it was like or what the effect on you um, or how it affected your creative process to be making a commissioned painting that was both site specific and context specific. You know, it wasn't any different than what I normally do at all. Um, and um, to your credit and the museum's credit, you were very hands off and just kind of let me do my thing, which is great. Um, like you mentioned earlier, you didn't suggest uh, the greatest hits or you know the more popular paintings. And so as a result, you have some really obscure works in here. And furthermore, you have um, my drawings that were derived from some of the more obscure works that really, in the end, barely referenced the original painting. Um, so it, it really wasn't much different than what I normally do. It was, um, in fact, I mean, it was you know, really exciting because I'm a fan of art and art history, of course. So it was, um, in a lot of cases, even surprising for me to find out that you had certain works, you know, like, um, um, well, whatever. It was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was exciting. It was good, yeah. Do you feel like it's possible that this would have an impact on the way you work in the future in terms of um, seeking to tie the work more closely to the context in which it's shown? Or, because um, you already talked about creating the context for showing your work, and here you were presented with a context mm, in mm, which mm, you right, 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 function. Right, right, right. Um, let me back up and, and answer the second part of your mm -hmm. first question. I'm sorry, because you were asking about the site specificity of, right, the, right. of the paintings, and that really has to do more with the form. Uh -huh. And so that wasn't an issue for me at all. It just, you know, we had a given space, What's the best way for um, me to kind of address that space? Um, uh, the only way in which that became uh, a concern was knowing that the works, again, like my paintings normally would be, would be viewed at different distances. Um, but that is something I kind of normally consider anyway. Um, the idea to break this up into 16 paintings instead of one large painting um, came from a format that I was already familiar with. You know, I, I make two foot squares, four foot squares, six foot squares, eight, you know, that's kind of like, you know, one of my um, um, static variables that I already use in, in, in the studio. Um, so it was just a matter of kind of matching up what I normally do and then, and then how it fits into, you know, the site. Right, um, so in a certain way we fit into the logic of of how you work, mm -hmm, um, but exactly. then we provided this whole sort of resource, this new resource of, of images. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then, as far as maybe um, like influencing what I would do in the future, because I did make something you know very specific for for the museum and out of the museum's collection, of course, it is one of the first bodies of work that I've where I've decided to tackle kind of one specific topic and make a body of work because up till now um, all the work has just been the best way to describe the content of the work is that it's um, autobiographical because it kind of comes I'm not, I'm not tackling any um, you know big themes or topics or anything like that I'm just um, drawing and collaging together things that um, I like and you know and, and as a result the work is like I said autobiographical or, or they become these kind of mindscapes um, so this is one of the first projects where I'm going to just address a very specific topic or body of work. I'm working on like 12 Labors of Hercules and eventually Seven Deadly Sins and I showed you some sketches where I'm looking at um, uh, figure drawing and uh, I'm looking at Picasso's skulls, you know. And so um, I'm kind of breaking down and um, kind of it's a way for me to organize my own output too. And you know, I think as you were showing the individual drawings, or the, the source imagery and then the drawings, I think um, we could all tell um, to some extent what you were interested, what might have interested you. I mean, we could see how you were responding. Sometimes you were picking out details. Sometimes you were sort of summarizing a whole work. But is there, can you talk a little bit more about what attracted you to different images? Um, what, you know, was it purely formal? Was there something about the content? Was it because it referenced something you had already been dealing with? What was going through your mind? I would say 90% is just formal mm -hmm. 
aesthetics. Um, and I can run through just some of them right now. This is, and you can see, sometimes it's more of a kind of literal translation like this. Um, sometimes it's a little harder to tell where it's coming from. In this case, not so difficult. But in the end, you wouldn't necessarily know this came from that. Again, a little more literal. That's just the eye. How closely do you have to look to pick out those details? Are you actually looking for details, or you just have this kind of you know what? facility it's, for extracting? It just whatever came to me, and uh -huh. and, uh, and that um, is what drove it, it's what drove what works I chose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, like Eames, you know, I'm a mm -hmm. big fan of Eames, right. so right. Um, it made sense to kind of address that. Uh, in in some cases, I didn't even know anything about the work. Mm -hmm. You know, just really responding. Just like yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is an obvious one for obvious and reasons, too. Coincidentally, yeah. you had actually used this image before. I didn't know it was in your collection. Knowing it was ours. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it, we were faded. And that one flipped over. Yes, <laughs> that's a reverse. This I had done. It's a detail of the pattern above. Somewhere I was reading um, an interview, actually it was with <laughs> That's great. You can see where that came from. With Peter Halley, yeah. and you were, um, ended up talking a little bit about surrealism and how um, in, you're comfortable with the connection of your work to surrealism because of the way your, your images sort of metamorphosize through various stages. And, um, but pop art seems like a really obvious source or reference as well. Could, do you see yourself in a lineage at all, or how do you position yourself in terms of past? No, I think I think pop art was really more about appropriation and taking from the low, of course, elevating to the high, or taking, you know, strategy um, um, whereby artists kind of um, celebrated the ordinary. Mm -hmm. You know, that it was it was, you know, conceptually, I don't think my work is aligned with pop art at all. Maybe just visually, because these are simplified forms or my work is very graphic or it uses the um, visual language of things that you would see in pop culture like signage or um, symbol systems that would be used by the Department of Transportation or by you know the Olympics or something like that but conceptually I don't I don't I don't see the work uh, as a continuation of pop art at all especially because it has nothing to do with appropriation I actually draw and make my own and if anything, own um, images, and if anything, I'm appropriating myself. Yeah. I'll zip through some more. These are just the pencils on each side of the picture plane. show some variation in the silk screening oh, process. Oh, sure, yeah. I want to ask a question. Let's see. It doesn't have to be one of ours, but just one where you get a fairly uh, good sense of the surface. Final painting. <laughs> I want to ask, or I, I, what I want to ask you to do is to is to actually walk us through just a little bit, maybe even with the pointer, because one of the things I think that's interesting about your work is that you're using screen printing. You're never, you know, these are paintings, but you're not painting with a brush on them. You're screen printing. It's a mechanical process that was originally invented um, to to make multiple to make reproductions that completely. Um, eliminated variation in the hand of the artist, but you actually reintroduce the hand. Um, in keeping with Warhol's practice, too, you introduce accident, 
and variation. I just wonder if you could just point out a few um, of the ways that you do that. Sure, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. What, I've, what I'm doing is using um, uh, a method to make paintings that's usually um, for um, making reproductions. Mm -hmm. um, but instead, I'm more interested in making productions and making originals and um, exploiting the, the process of silk screening, just like you said. So in, in, in some cases, I feel like I'm, um, you know, when, when, when you make art, you're communicating to different audiences, um, you know, people you don't know, just a general audience. You're, you're, you're entering a dialogue with yourself and you're entering a dialogue with other artists. So I feel like with, with my paintings, only people who know the process of silk screening are gonna get some of my inside jokes. And some of those include, um, like here you'll see this is an image that was um, screened once, then the screen was laid over, offset, and then pulled halfway just to get that kind of fragmented. In this case, this was a, um, pulled twice. The image was in the background, and then the image was tightly registered and fragmented and pulled you know, just a bit to uh, get this kind of two-tone effect. Uh, let me see. This is a little more straightforward. Um, here I'm using a lot of, uh, well, I use a lot of uh, metallics and pearlescence and fluorescence and translucence. And here you see the same image mirrored on top but in a translucent yellow. So it really just becomes abstract. Unless you're looking carefully, you don't really recognize, hey, this isn't a mirrored um, Egyptian figure. Oh, by the way, before you go on. Oh. You go back to that one. Those white squiggles are actually ah, yes. from the side Twombly thing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. In some cases, I took uh, the final drawing, like this is a, an Oldenburg, you know, the, uh, the clothespin. clothespin, and just repeated it mm -hmm. to make this kind of radial, you mm -hmm. know, picking up on other radials that I mm -hmm. saw in other artworks. And a radial is, is kind of a, a theme that I've used or, or an image that I've used in other paintings in the Black Hole series of paintings. Here, you're, we're looking at you know, the same image offset with a translucent red over a solid blue, almost like a, like a th all, you know, 3D effect. Oh, here, um, this is the same image with the screen on it with different paint mixed on the screen and then pulled and fragmented on top. So these are some of the kind of inside jokes I was talking about. 